Yeah, I think this new season is going to be sort of interesting with just the two of us. Yeah, I think it might be a little bit awkward uh, with these three segments and two hosts, but it's going to be all good. We're going to pull it off. It's fine. Yeah. I mean, I'm very happy for both Ingrid and Casey, and I wish they could uh, still be here, but um, who are you, please? Uh, uh, am I on the right show? Can we get a producer in here, please? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to For Your Reference, brought to you by your friendly neighborhood librarians at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. I'm Robin Beatonbow. And I'm Paris Leyland. And I'm Sarah Johnson. I'm new here. All right. And welcome, Sarah. Uh, if you're out there and you watch season one, you'll remember uh, Ingrid Ruffin and Casey Fox, uh, who are no longer with us. Uh, to be clear, they're fine. They just do new jobs elsewhere, y'all. <laughs> I've heard they miss us terribly. Yeah, um, Casey's off working uh, with the Big Ears Festival. And Ingrid has moved on to lovely Las Vegas, where she is now an associate dean with UNLV. Yeah, it is heartbreaking how sad they look in these photos, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but on a brighter note, we have a new host. Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I'm a commons librarian here at UT Libraries. And a fun fact about me is I grew up on a farm with Tennessee fainting goats. And yes, they're exactly what you think they are. Uh, so goats that faint. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so family uh, is kind of going to be a little bit of our theme tonight. And um, so a question I have for you guys is, um, do either of you have siblings? Or wait, do either of you have siblings you're willing to talk about live on the internet? <laughs> I appreciate you reframing that, Robin. <laughs> yeah. Why, yes, I do. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, and this is always an interesting question for me because I'm an only child. Um, you might have guessed this, uh, given how I am, those of you who know me well. Uh, and I'm also a Leo, which means you can always count on me to, to bring a conversation back around to uh, myself. Mm -hmm. I've known a lot of Leos. Is that synonymous with douchiness? <laughs> yeah, if I had feelings, that would hurt, Paris. But, <laughs> Don't um, at me, Leos. I know y'all are out there getting your feelings hurt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do have a lot of friends with siblings, and uh, some of them seem to communicate with their siblings better than others. Um, where, do, where do you, your family sort of fall on the scale? Um, so I have an older brother and growing up, we had that typical relationship. We were just at each other's throats all the time about anything. It didn't matter. But, um, there comes a time in your adult life where you're tired and you have other things to do. And so you squash it and you're like, it's fine. We'll just deal with our weird differences. So that's where we're at these days. <laughs> How about you, Sarah? Uh, I am the complete opposite. <laughs> I have a younger sister who is my best friend and we like even have, it sometimes thing seems like we have our own language when we talk to each other. It's so very different. Very cool. Very cool. Well, tonight we have some very special guests uh, here to talk about families and how they communicate. And our first segment we're calling Reviewer 2. So I'd like to extend, <clears throat> excuse me, a warm welcome to our very first guest tonight, Dr. Jordan Allen from Utah Valley University. Welcome, Jordan. Hello. Tell us a little bit about you and uh, and your work. Sure. So, um, uh, um, <laughs> it's so funny. I do my work. Um, <laughs> um, I'm an interpersonal and family communication scholar. I did my graduate work at the University of Nebraska, and my specialty 
my area of emphasis is non-normative family relationships. And so like, I'm really interested in estranged relationships, but people who would consider themselves functionally estranged or twin relationships or step family relationships, anything that's just kind of outside of that nuclear typical formation. Which, uh, Actually, there's a lot more families than you might think, right? <laughs> most, honestly. You know? <laughs> it's pretty much, uh, when you get down to it, it's pretty much uh, all of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, glad to have you with us. Uh, now, playing the role of reviewer two tonight is Dr. Nicole Allen from Utah State University. Welcome to the show. Hello. Place to be here. Thank you for having us. <laughs> We're so glad to have you here. So it's your turn. Tell us a little bit about you and your work. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Utah State University. Most of my research looks at public discourse. Um, I use a lot of rhetorical theory. And then, of course, I look at these families um, and um, sort of people who find themselves outside the prescribed norm with Jordan. Okay, so um, quick question. You both have the same last name and uh, I notice a resemblance. Are you <laughs> yes, we are twins. No, we just met. It was so random. You <laughs> said Nebraska Lincoln. We found each other. We're like, do you, does your mom? No. <laughs> That's great. So um, tonight, uh, you two are going to be talking a little bit about families, I guess, because this is context, but you are going to be talking about methodologies. Um, so your question that we will be discussing is how can we expand our definition of multi and mixed methods? So I'm going to let you two get to it. Uh, reminder to our audience, if you have questions for either of our guest scholars, you can drop them in the comments on YouTube or on Facebook and uh, we can surface those when y'all are done. When you see my face again, it'll be time for Q&A. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I guess we should also say that we did add a brief addendum onto our question, which is, and why in your research is this an important question to think about? So Jordan, why don't you go ahead and start? So um, I think we're, when we're thinking about, do you want to make or do you want to make yourself first feedback? So when we're starting to think about um, multi-method research in general, is it family specific? One of the reasons that taking um, a multi-method approach, which is using, well, for us, using qualitative interpersonal communication um, methods, interviews, focus groups, and then what Nicole does, rhetorical public discourse methods, is that there's a fundamental belief that families are private and that their communication has to be studied in isolation of almost everything else. Um, but what we know, especially for families who exist outside the norm, that public communication is very important and it shapes, well, it's for everybody, but it particularly shapes and impacts those relationships. And so having a dual multi-method approach lets us tackle that in a way that having a single approach either way wouldn't really be able to capture. And so in your research, what, like maybe let's focus on um, like the twin studies. Okay. Um, so how would having me and the rhetorical approach kind of help you in that case? What did it reveal or unveil that perhaps we would have not examined otherwise? I Yeah, so there's um, the scientific discourse surrounding twins, zygosity, whether they're identical or fraternal, um, because it's largely like a public discourse without kind of the rhetorical nature of it, we wouldn't be able to trace how it actually influences and shapes twin identity. Um, sometimes problematically for twins. And so without having kind of that broader, more global view, we wouldn't have insight into some of the struggles, particularly with like being identical or being the same or the importance of being physically similar and then kind of the the social expectations that come around with that. So it's all it's all linked in kind of this complex way that you couldn't see without two methods, at least two methods. Yeah, and I think one thing, when we were doing the study, we interviewed, um, a whole host of twins and like the first for our first study on twin intimacy um which is what we called twin specific intimacy but one of the things that was really interesting to me that i hadn't really considered is that most twins um rarely talked about being a twin and they were in the interviews so curious about what other twins were saying because there's very little gauge for them about what's what's considered normal what's considered healthy because they're so frequently just compared to singletons or people who had individual births about what is healthy or what was normal. 
Yeah. And I think also that came out when we asked them a question about conflict and we know from ourselves, <laughs> but also from research that twin conflict, interpersonal conflict can be a lot more intense than singleton conflict for a variety of reasons. And when we asked that question, but we, you know, we disclosed to them that we were twins. It's, it's amazing how like more information, how much more information and how much more safe they felt when they knew we were also, we were familiar with the twin conflict. Yeah, it's kind of getting an insider's perspective. So um, I wonder if we could also talk about estranged family relationships. Perfect. And then in your research, you also noted positive estrangement, that it could be like a, a good thing, but um, sort of the critical or the rhetorical was understanding that that's not generally in the literature, that estrangement is good. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, hinting at the importance of the public discourse and the method. This is a very leading question. Yeah, of course. So um, the, the where that paper, which was ultimately my dissertation, came from was kind of like a proto multi-method approach. And so it really came from like a grounded perspective where there was um, there's people who identify as estranged, but they don't identify that as like a negative thing. They don't like feel bad about it. They don't feel a need to reconcile. It's just another type of relationship. And so to kind of understand how that why that was contradicting estrangement, um, Julie Moore and I did a textual analysis of existing family, um, family, not just communication, but family research broadly to see how they're defining healthy family. And so one of the things that's really common in it is that like healthy families have open communication, which is problematic for a lot of reasons. But by the very nature, um, by the very nature of having communication be a key element of family relationships or functional family relationships, anybody in an estranged relationship, even if they were happy, even if they wanted it, even if they were actively maintaining it, um, couldn't couldn't be consider themselves healthy. There's like no discursive resources for them to articulate that, even though that was their lived experience. Very true. And one thing that I really liked that we kind of got to explore in a paper together was talking about how um, non-human objects can really influence people's um, experience of estrangement. And that's where they kind of get indications that you feel good about your estrangement, but you shouldn't. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that more specifically in your findings. Yeah, and so another part of that paper was the idea that even though there are strange relationships, they're not done. So like communicating, there's some communication. So we used um, actor network theory to talk about how objects maintain a strange relationships. They're distant, they're not intimate that objects are communicating to do that. And so one participant um, mentioned um, uh, or the Christmas cards. So like, and just a generic Christmas card where there's like the whole family, kind of the Norman Rockwell. Um, and she just talked about engaging and interacting with this object in a way that highlighted her relationship was indeed not like that. Um, and she even said that like, even though I, I enjoy maintaining a relation, a strange relationship, like that's the relationship for us that, um, she felt bad in that moment. And so the idea that this object that exists outside of her can make and shape her emotions and her affect and her feelings is something that was like repeated over and over again in the interviews for my um, dissertation in this first study we did. But like really drives home the idea that this, what the nuclear family is, is communicated or what the perfect healthy family is, is communicated to us all the time, really problematically. And I also remember when one excerpt from that that always really stuck up, stuck up, <laughs> stuck out rather <laughs> to me was the discussion from um, a woman who was recalling how her experience at university and getting all of the emails from the university talking about family day or talking about parenting and all of those things really also reinforced a lot of those things that giving her negative feelings about being estranged from, if I remember correctly, it was her her mother, if she was estranged from, if I'm remembering that interview correctly. And so what do you think some of the practical implications for understanding the force of these external um, objects and discourses on um, those, those relationships should be? Yeah, so I think the first thing is to remember that like our communication and who we're communicating with is both public and private. Like that distinction, especially when we're talking about challenges, is really, it's not an important distinction. I think it's kind of a harmful distinction. And so when we're thinking about like how family's privilege and how family is centered in, 
in a and being close with your family there's i think it's important just practically to pay attention what and not only who but what is communicating that message to us because it's not until we can become aware of that message that we can consciously confront that message which um i think is like incredibly helpful yeah that participant she mentioned like letters about parent parent week and it actually caused her to try and reconcile with her mother which was horrible and then she ended up again estranged from her mother um, but she cited those letters specifically as a reason for her re trying reconciliation so one thing that i think you're hitting on that we haven't discussed explicitly <laughs> but is like the need to um sort of disintegrate this public private binary and i know in rhetoric because we study like public discourse mm -hmm. there's this sort of impl this implication that there is a private discourse and that somehow they're separate and we need to kind of figure out how to bridge those together so um when you were researching the um estrangement literature you talked about examining like family research specifically and so what do you think is something to keep in mind or what was something that you kept in mind while you were navigating um, doing sort of a rhetorical critique of the family literature? What were some of your struggles? Yeah, so some of my struggles were, well, first, because I'm a trained social scientist, like my my reflex is just to believe the social science, that that fact is a given, it's not constructed. And so that was like a big hurdle to overcome, to see how the literature was constructing the healthier functional family. And so just getting over kind of like that post, I was a post, -pos I was a positive, but kind of getting over that post positivism. And eventually, you know, like you can't study how this communication, this professional public communication is shaping if you believe it's a given. Right. So like you have to inherently believe it's it's construction um, on some level. And so that was like that was the big struggle. But then I think something else is like I was doing the interviews like concurrently. And so those were your, the interviews and what participants were saying were kind of sensitizing me to a lot of the things that were it was so strange that were like showing up in the literature. And so like a participant would say, like, I don't feel the need to reconcile. But then the literature would say people who are estranged should absolutely try and reconcile the family unit, blah, 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 blah. And so just like the mirror images was sometimes kind of spooky. And definitely probably persuading other people to not automatically accept that literature is kind of a challenge. Yeah, <laughs> but I, we, uh, go ahead. No, 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 what were you saying? It's okay. No, it's just, I was gonna say that's a struggle that we've had, um, especially when we're speaking to a social scientific audience. Um, the idea of questioning or argumentation in general, which is which is accepted in rhetoric, is not the accepted uh, communication style in at least family communication and interpersonal. And that's a struggle that we've had trying to um, publish together. Sure. But we've also had other struggles. And so I thought now would be a great time <laughs> to look at some actual reviewer to comments um, about a piece that we wrote together that um, had a lot of problems in fairness to the reviewers, but um, it was sort of our first stab at doing like a rhetorical piece with the qualitative methods piece. So it was a rhetorical analysis of tw the twin methodology and um, like ideologies of biologicalism that kind of go along with that. And then we paired that with these interviews that we did and it didn't go well, <laughs> but the, I, I think it was a little clumsy, but there were some things that I think hit on the, um, some of the review or two comments were more specific to the struggle of having a multi-method that is both rhetorical and qualitative. And so I thought I would read to you like a couple of sentences and then you can talk about what you think the struggle is here in terms of marrying those two methods together. Um, so one article, one reviewer said, um, when it comes to your finding section, I wanted more. The opener in the literature currently compromise, comprise rather 12 pages of your paper, while the analysis section alone consists of 10 pages. More space and time is needed to given, given to flesh out and explore your qualitative data. Additionally, your analysis, oh, they don't like the way that we set up nature and nurture. But anyway, so can you kind of speak to what you think is happening in that comment for that reviewer? I think it was I, my inclination is that was a rhetorical view, reviewer. Uh, I think that I think that they just saw we were making we were making more arguments than we had space for. And I think that like we 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 had a lot we had a lot of stuff we had to do in that paper. We had to set up, 
you know, this idea that twin studies themselves were really problematic. They had this this history, but that's also, you know, a eugenics history that's tied to racism and sexism and essentialism. Um, and then we we had to set that up, and then we had to tie that into the qualitative data analysis. And and so we were just there was too much to be done in one paper, and I think that is what they they were really talking about. Was good feedback. Still good feedback. I mean, it's one hundred percent right. <laughs> but right. I, yeah, but I think one thing that I really appreciated about working on this project with you because it kind of stemmed from uh, interpretive qualitative methods class that we took together. Well, and, and the clinical kind of class with Carly. Oh, that too. Yeah. yeah. But one thing that I appreciated about working on this with you was that we just started working on twins, and then I kind of got into the history of twin studies, and it was never really clear to me. Um, until I got to like the very, like the founder of twin studies. And I, we found out that he was the founder of twin studies. He was the founder of eugenics and he was the founder of the nature versus nurture um, divide, right? And he's really the one that explicated that. And there's like a very specific citation pattern that goes from Sir Francis Galton, who is the um, cousin of Darwin. And it goes from him then some British people are working on it and then it like goes to Europe and like the next person to pick it up was um, Frere von Frescher, who is um, sort of, yeah, <laughs> in, um, well, first in the Weimar Republic and then in Nazi Germany. And he's most famous for advocating for twin studies, but also for working with Joseph Mengele. And then twin studies comes to the United States and enjoys like a similar, very controversial history. And so I think that had we just thought about twin studies in the current moment, we miss this whole history that examines how twin studies and nature versus nurture undergird this whole sort of racist, white supremacist, um, racial hierarchy that was very much tied to like the British empire. And so, um, but I also wanna make those speak together because I feel like people who are just going to read a paper about twins and how they negotiate intimacy should also be very aware of this history because it's one that no one in communication studies talks about when they're using the twin studies methodology today. No, and I think that that is like our next step. And I think that, I think strategically we went about it by um, publishing different papers. So we're hoping that we are publishing the history of twin studies. We publish our twin intimacy. And so we're hoping we can build then on the previous work to, to, to do more work for us in that in that paper, because I think it's also important to point to how in private dis private discourse, but in interpersonal and family communication discourse, these very problematic logics are kept alive and not only alive, but sedimented and concretized by twins, by twins family members, and of course by single twins who are non-twins. That's what we call not, not us, but like the community calls non-twins. Um, and so I think tying these together is really, really important because if we want to have teeth to our critique, if we want to, hopefully cause some sort of difference, not transformation, that's a bold term. We have to be able to link it to some sort of concrete communication practice, um, not only rhetorically and in public discourse, but also interpersonally in our everyday conversations. And without qualitative and rhetorical methods, these things are in different conversations, but they really need to be in the same place. Like we can't be talking about twin studies like they have been. Hello, I'm back. <laughs> Are you all ready for some questions? Um, I'll get us started off um, since, you know, you're both uh, you're both professors and you're both doing this, um, you know, sort of multi method, uh, mixed method kind of research. If you had if you could go back to when you were first writing that article um, where you got the reviewer two comments, uh, like what what was it? Did you have a moment where you're like, OK, this is this is how we sort of fix the problem. Um, and if you were gonna give advice to any of your students on, on how to do one of these studies, where would you start them? I guess I will start, Jojo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess like in the sense we've, we did that submission, one thing that we've been very more, much more cognizant of is being explicit about what we're doing. So oftentimes when we do this type of work and we submit it to social scientists, 
and we have like rhetorical analysis at the beginning, we get comments like your literature review is so long and you're like, oh my gosh, that's not what it is. <laughs> it's not a literature review. Um, and so, but of course, like they don't know that and it's very hard to, for it would be, I think unreasonable to expect them to know that. I don't know why we did without explicitly stating at the forefront that this is a multi-method piece. And we've also done a lot more interrogation about what it means to do like a rhetorical um, critical critical qualitative multi-method piece in a way that um, if I were to advise a student in the future, um, being more upfront, but also being um, sort of in conversations with those method um, with those method conversations. And that's something that we never, we're not very good about explicitly doing early on. And then I guess also, sometimes you don't need to do both at the same time. So we took this one publication and we turned it into like a series of what will now be three publications. Um, and it's yes. <laughs> and it's um, sad because I feel like people won't miss, some people will miss that history that I think is so important. But in that third publication where we're going to do the analysis of like biologicalism in um, just twin conversations that we should be able to pull it all out. So that's what I would say. Doran, do you have anything to add? Oh yeah, I mean, we really thought we nailed it. And yeah. we, I mean, we just, we read it over and we're like, this is so good, right? And so I think just like, like on an emotional level, I would just say that like this review, I mean, these these this, these comments were just phenomenal and like they shaped really like our research agenda for like the next two or three years. So just be patient. It doesn't mean you don't have good ideas. It just means you don't know everything. Like you have to take right. the advice. Right. Uh, this is one thing we brought up in uh, episode one last year when Sam Martin and I were talking about uh, Reviewer 2 and who Reviewer 2 sort of is to yeah. uh, the community. Reviewer 2 can be really harsh, but often they're spot on. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's why it hurts. Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> it hurts so much more because you know they're right. right. Yeah. Could you have and just been nicer about it? <laughs> Well, and you can be nicer. I think we should start that too. You can marry Barry, your reviewer to feedback. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think we should, we should sort of as a, as a discipline, as the academy, start looking at like, why, why does everything have to feel like a hazing ritual, right? <laughs> yeah. And also reading reviewer feedback, like reading it like a textual analysis. So they're saying you can't like, we get this more with sci social scientific feedback. Like you can't say this, like you're not right, blah, 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 blah. And so it's like more reading behind their comments. So like there's an epistemological and ontological conflict that you have to make explicit in order right. to even have that conversation. But that's something we face with the social science audience that we don't with a rhetorical or more critical minded audience. Yeah, I think it happens in, in both though, because I know one of the struggles I had with, um, with my dissertation in particular was that um, I, I kept forgetting that other people weren't in my head. <laughs> like, how is this not obvious to you? Oh, yeah. I didn't tell you. Okay. So. But, um, one other question for me. Um, you talk about in one of your papers, Troubling the Functional Dysfunctional Family, um, you talk a little bit about Judith Butler and uh, her theory of performativity and like how that creates you know, these binaries. Uh, uh -huh. Can you say a little more about that or? Yeah, so um, that theory, I wrote that paper with um, Julia Moore and that theory was really um, integral to how we, how, how participants were kind of like framing their experience. And so we did, we used Judith Butler's theory to look at how the family functional, the functional family was being framed, was being performed really in um, the social scientific literature. And so like how it was being performed from that level. And then the binary became like, if you are, if you're not functional, if you don't meet these criteria, and some of them are very explicit criteria, like some <laughs> of them are like shockingly direct criteria, um, then you're not functional. And so what that theory really did for us is give us a language to talk about how there were people who saw themselves as functional, who did not want to be consider themselves dysfunctional. Um, and so they were really troubling this idea of what a functional or dysfunctional family looks like. And so um, that theory was like incredibly important. And then it also, it was like really cool because it tied together both our textual analysis of the social scientific literature and then our qualitative analysis um, of our interviews as well. And so, yeah, that theory was, um, for that paper like it really showed how people were constrained but also moving to try and resist that constraint as well 
Cool. Well, uh, I think we are getting here at 7.30 or just past 7.30. So I think I'm going to have to cut us off, even though this is an incredibly interesting conversation. I would like to thank both of you, the doctors, Alan, uh, <laughs> for joining us this evening. Uh, what a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for having us. This was so fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to send you over to Paris Whalen and a special guest to learn about how to, how to find research in this area in Czech this out. Welcome back. My name is Paris Whalen. If y'all don't remember, I am the media literacy librarian at the University of Tennessee. Thanks for joining me again. For those of you who can't remember, the check this out segment is for those of you who, um, <coughs> sorry. <ooh. coughs> so the check this out segment is the portion where we discuss um, whatever subject that we've been going over in the review or two, so non-normative family communication. And then we discuss the resources and tools that viewers can use to continue learning about our subject, okay? So today our discussion is gonna be about family communication in the form of, uh, we're gonna talk more about information literacy, which I'll define a little bit later. And joining me in this conversation is going to be Shanna Destine. Welcome, Hi. welcome. Thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to join me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so um, Shanna Destin is a history librarian and member of the LGBTQ plus community, and she is passionate about justice for oppressed communities across the world and in the African diaspora. diaspora. <laughs> so, <laughs> for and you. a new mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, our role as librarians and liaisons is to familiarize ourselves with uh, research tools and materials within the library, resources on the campus as a whole, and in our community um, that may contribute to the success of our students, faculty, and staff. So essentially, um, as liaisons, our information literacy skills need to be on point, or as we say, um, we need to be competent, okay? So, um, ACRL, for those of you who are interested, is an association under the American Libraries Association, so ALA, defines information literacy as a set of abilities requiring individuals to recognize when information is needed and have the ability to locate, evaluate, and use it effectively. Okay, so if you're trying to figure out what I'm talking about, let me give you an example. Um, I have a dog, he's amazing, but sometimes we have some behavioral issues, okay? So I recognize that I probably need to get him into an obedience uh, training. So first of all, I need to, um, I've, I know that I have a problem that he needs some training. So now I need to figure out where uh, I'm going to train him, how far, things like that. And then I need to figure out which, um, which training place is gonna work for me. And that's through my personal evaluation. I don't wanna go far. I don't wanna be in particular areas, things like that. So at the end of the day, um, I finally came to a place and we are scheduled. That is a real life version of um, using, uh, of going through information literacy, okay? So what makes information literacy so difficult is that there's an overwhelming amount of it coming at us every single day. We've got social media, you've got your emails coming in, you've got your news notifications, all of that. And somehow we're supposed to process that and evaluate it. So um, basically information literacy is filling in that learning gap. And so we're gonna kind of talk through that today. Um, I'm gonna be speaking from the academic perspective and Shannon is gonna kind of speak from the public. So, so that you guys have resources and you can access the information, okay? So with all of that being said, um, I'd like to just kind of go through information literacy. <laughs> so the components of information literacy are now on the screen and they're basically listed there, identify, find, evaluate, apply, and acknowledge sources of information. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with information literacy or you're just starting to remember, know that um, we're building information literacy skills and it takes practice okay so that's what we're here to do today i've been talking for quite a while sheena is there something you would like to add when it comes to information literacy um not really but just to keep in mind that you know it's a very multi-dimensional thing it is shifted and it, it moves and changes with your social and cultural context so 
you have to keep that in mind with how you're ingesting, basically how you're ingesting information goes through your lens of your experience and like, you know, your lifestyle, your culture, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. So basically no matter what the source, you need to think critically about the author, the purpose and the context of the information. So starting from the first step, as a student or a faculty staff member building these skills, you want to begin with um, a broad term. So I might just use family communications if I'm not sure what I'm talking, uh, what I'm actually looking for. Mm -hmm. And I might visit something that I've spoken about on multiple episodes, which are research guides. OK, um, I may search. I may go into the UT Libraries webpage, click on research guides, and I may search by subject and find the Child and Family Studies Guide, which is uh, curated by our subject librarian, Donna, is it Donna Brackett? Donna Brackett? Donna Brackett. And um, you're basically going to use those tabs within that research, uh, that LibGuide, to guide you through your uh, research. It will include things like databases, journals, and professional associations. So you don't have to just use it for research. It might be a great way to kind of understand your uh, discipline a little bit better. So what places would the public go to research information on family communication? Um, I mean, I like to start where people are at, and a lot of people automatically go to go automatically go to Google, yeah. um, which is fine, right? But the thing is that Google will bring you back every answer, so it's it's gonna give you anything that says family communication in it, whether it's good, bad, funny, you know, satire, whatever. And so you're gonna want to really like dig into your information literacy skills um, at that, you know, to kind of wade through all that. You can use Google Scholar. Um, and the good thing is if you're, I know we're talking about the public, but if you're a student and you use Google Scholar and you're logged in, you'll get some stuff that we have in our databases. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it'll pull in things from different databases. So you don't have to go into individual ones, but if you're the general public, you'll get like, you know, dissertations, theses, things that are not behind a paywall in any kind of way. Um, but sometimes the language gets really difficult to understand. So it really depends on your background. Um, if you can understand those things. Um, some of the stuff I can't because what I do know is family communication as a whole is studied by psychology, sociology, you know, and then child and family studies. So you might get things that have that kind of jargon from those different disciplines in them. Um, and if you don't, if you don't have the background, it might be a little bit difficult. Um, but you, it'll help kind of clarify what you're looking for. I feel like what I would suggest for the public is if you do get into dissertations and articles and such, is to read the abstract. The abstract is usually in very plain. Um, English, and you can see if this is, you know, if this article is something you want to dig deeper into based on the first couple sentences. Sweet. Thank you so much. I um, taught an information seeking process class earlier today, and I talked about this all day long, and I was like super <laughs> excited, but also I was like, I got to tone it back for the uh, for the podcast tonight. So I love um, you some abstracts. <laughs> So um, once we've kind of explored the topic and we want to narrow down on a focus, I might um, start to use advanced search options. So if I went to a database, I chose um, something with child and family studies, and there's a database in there, say Eric or something, I may, I may start using um, keyword terms that maybe I got from Google search. So I may use non-normative family communications um, all separately, and I may use Boolean operators such as or and or not to kind of help me um, sort through some of those uh results so that we no longer have a million maybe we have thirty thousand because that seems like yeah. a lot but it is a lot less than a million so um you can use any search terms like i said from the um language you found in your exploration so i also might use filters and limiters as well which are usually on like the left hand side of your databases so you may choose peer reviewed. You may actually, in some of them, choose methodology. I noticed that, which is really awesome. Um, you can also choose dates. That is my dog whining. I was like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So, Shada, how might someone without access to UTK's resources uh, find search terms and basic information? Well, I am really a fan of using those same abstracts. Um, abstracts usually introduce a lot of terms, so I usually go through them and write down terms as I'm reading them. Um, and then, again, like you said, like I might go through some of these these um, free free search places, Google, whatever, and I um, look at what's tagged under some of the articles because sometimes they have tags, and I'll write those down. So I, you literally, I always tell my students, you can find search terms anywhere. I sometimes find search terms on Twitter. Um, but yeah, <laughs> <Other than> that. 
If you don't have access to UT's um, resources, you can um, get a one day pass at the library, which I don't think a lot of people know, but you can come in and get like a guest pass and use all of our computers and our databases for the day. Um, but you can go to the public library and work with those librarians. You know, they're really good at helping folks. And then um, government sources, if you have like certain um, like state departments that focus on families and do research, they they sometimes have like very public databases that you can use. So, I mean, there's a lot of a lot out there. And I mean, also, I get people who email me from the public all the time um, who need help with things. And I help them like I help students. I just help them using things that they have access to. Like, I'll show them how to search Google or how to search um, some a free site in some kind of way. So it's not you can reach out to like a librarian at a university who does child and family studies. Yeah, I say that all the time. If all else fails and you can't find anything, reach out to your your librarian or a librarian and we can yeah. help get you there, okay? And if we don't know, we will find somebody to help you. I mean, I've sent people to librarians at other schools, you know, yeah. like we, librarians love to help you. Yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah, we're not gatekeepers. We like to share information. We share research guides and things like that. We get inspiration. I get so excited know. when people ask me questions. Like, yes. I'm like, oh, yay. Okay, cool. Let me help. <laughs> <laughs> so um, those are really great examples. Thank you for giving them to me. Um, so after I've kind of developed a uh, some language and some general understanding of my topic, I might start evaluating my materials, which is the next step after this. So when I say evaluating materials, you start to determine the quality of a source, the credibility, and the validity. Um, so you're reviewing mo multiple different points of view from your own opinion. So I might take a couple of articles and say, all right, well, I need to pull this apart. What about this methodology? What's going on in here? Um, or I might say they quoted someone, but they misquoted. You know, things like this happen and you just need to be aware of that. And that's in an academic setting. So like, what are some ways in which a public can engage in uh, the process of evaluating information shared by family, uh, social media and their own research process using like search engines. Whew. This is something I talk about so much now because we're in the COVID age and everybody's quoting different things that are wrong. Um, so I'm always telling folks, and these are people close to me, my like my kids' godparents, like check your sources. Like what 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 um, website did that come from? And if it says like oh it came from you know TurkishBot.com, it's probably not. <laughs> not credible or, you know, at least find a second source to back it up. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to be like super elitist and be like, oh, only if it says .org, because a lot of bots and a lot of like other organizations who are like counter to whatever you're trying to research are also using .orgs. So what I would say is like, you know, if they are saying, oh, this government document says blah, 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 then go find that government document. Government documents are free. You can find them um, and read what it actually says, not just the sentence that they're quoting, but the sentences around it. Um, make sure that the information is updated, right? Like, because, you know, especially like in a current, you know, current days when information is moving so fast and like science is moving so fast and you, what you might have quoted in January may already be outdated, right? So it's like, you know, there's a, it's a process, but you have to do it because what we don't want is to be out there sounding like we don't know what we're talking about, right? We want to make sure that what we have, our information's together, we're together, and we know what we're looking at. Um, yeah, and so I, I literally walk cousins through information literacy. Props, <laughs> <Well, laughs> like, you <laughs> working on while you're off? Okay, I'm like, well, well let's show me cite your sources. Where did that come from? And then we have to talk about it. <laughs> so, We've evaluated our sources as students. So maybe this came in the form of like a literature review. You talked about a couple of things, you pulled them apart, you compared them. Now it's time to kind of apply your knowledge. So for example, according to an, an article I read in the Journal of Child and Family Studies, you can paraphrase a um, expert, you mm -hmm. can cite, you can also download an image um, from a database and just incorporate it into a visual presentation. These are different ways that um, students, faculty, and staff can practice that portion of um, applying their knowledge or applying what they've learned to their current knowledge. So in the real world setting, how does the public apply that information they've gathered and like foster discussion or the exchange of ideas and information? I mean, I'm a big fan of like, I, I will debate you on Twitter. I will. And I like, and the thing is like, I'm gonna tell you right now, nobody should debate a librarian. They should not. It's not a good look because I will literally cite a source. I will be like, oh, well here, um, the CDC just released this article and here's what it says. And here's this. And I like, 
we're not going to have people like with misinformation around you, right? Because mm-hmm. I mean, certain things are polite debates, right? Like certain things we can just like kiki about and it's funny, like, oh, Paris, why did you go to that dog school? You can go to this dog school, whatever. But, you know, when we get into things that are like dangerous or when we get into things, you know, like, oh, we should drink bleach to cure ourselves of whatever. Like now we have to really get into it because I don't want you to drink bleach. <laughs> I want you to have like real information about what's going on. And like, you know, and and also people tend to, like, some people will use bad information and weaponize that. So you just want to make sure, especially, like, if we're talking about family communication, like, the family, like, family is basically built around communication, good or bad. So what we want is healthy communication. And what we want is cohesive families. Like, we don't want, you know, we don't want any toxic situations. So in those cases, we want to make sure that our situations together, we're battling misinformation. I think that's kind of everybody's job at this point. Mm -hmm. Whew, well said. That was heavy. <laughs> I know. Sorry, I had to go no, there. <laughs> so the last step in uh, the information of literacy components is acknowledgement, and it's exactly what it sounds like. This is like your work cited page if you're a student. Um, util- utilizing copyrights or you know Creative Commons license or guidelines. Okay, give credit to an image. Things like that are going to be the acknowledge portion. Okay, so what are some examples of the public um, can use can can use to credit their sources and be aware of the limits of free speech and censoring? Well, first things first, like, I mean, you know, copyright, there's fair use. So you can use things in a debate and not be in trouble. You can use things in, you know, your class project, not get in trouble. You want to be careful about using things that you're going to publish or make money on. So, but you, I mean, you can credit people for the most part and not get into trouble. So I want to start there, but um, I am... A, f- a fan of, of captions and tagging and, you know, um, especially to link information together. Like if um, I, there was a time when me and my wife were trying to have a baby, we were, you know, looking for information. And as we got information, we would share information with other groups. And if you, t- and if we hashtagged it, then we could all link those together and find them when they're about certain things. So that was helpful when we're just looking for information specific to a part of the process. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I think that on social media, if I, share somebody's information, I always, always credit them for that information. And, you know, on social media, people love that because that's, that's a little bit of a cosign. That's what we call it, where I'm coming from. And that's a good, and that's a good thing. So, yeah, I think that that's it. Well, awesome. Um, so that basically <laughs> wraps up the information literacy components. And we've kind of given you an example, a long example, about how you might search for information successfully as a member of the public or an institution. Um, Shane, is there anything like you'd like to add? No, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, Thanks for same it. here. Um, hopefully walking our viewers through the components of information literacy and demonstrating what they learned um, or demonstrating how to go about it will help them and build their confidence and they can go forward with this information, start practicing it, okay? That is the goal if you're confused. That's the goal. So so this basically, this concludes our Check This Out segment. I wanna thank Shana for joining us again and being so willing and excited to share her wealth of information with us. Until next time, y'all take it easy. And I think we're actually gonna move on to stories in a stack with, What's that girl's name? Uh, Sarah Johnson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Stories in the Stacks. I'm Sarah Johnson, and I don't actually know if I'm supposed to be here, but y'all are fun, so I think I'm going to stay. Um, so tonight, I'm going to talk about genealogy specifically genealogy research. And it all starts with a little story from my mother declaring, we are a first family of Tennessee. Okay, she really didn't say it like that, but that seems like something that needs emphasis when you say it out loud. You know what I mean? Okay, maybe it's just me. Actually, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's take it back to the beginning before I found out all this cool stuff about my family. So we embarked into this journey the way anyone else might. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, So what do we do? We Googled it. (laughs) Seems like the logical thing to do. I'm kidding. But but honestly, that's where we started. Um, We were searching to find whatever we could. 
especially since we were just starting out, we really wanted to try to find the best places to do more in-depth research. Um, we found ancestry websites. We found books about family members, you know, way back when. Uh, we talked with family members to see like all like, you know, anything that they could remember. And we even used like the archives down um, at the East Tennessee Historical Society here in town. Uh, we found all of these avenues to be kind of doing like doing this kind of research. And we went to thinking, let's research. We got this. Like no one's ever done this before ever. Now. I just made it sound like we did a whole bunch of work, right? <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, for our family, the majority of the work had already been done by a lot of other people. So thank you. Um, whether it be family members who had devoted a lot of their time to learn about our own family um, or individuals who are just interested in this kind of work, the majority of the information we found had already been found for us. Uh, all we had to do was just follow the breadcrumbs. So here's a little peek into my own family history because why not share cool things? So the first thing that we kind of found was my paternal great grandmother was a Buchanan from Scotland. Love Scotland. Some of her brothers and nephews had already tracked down a lot of the genealogy connections for that part of the family. So there you go. Um, and in fact, the Buchanan line goes all the way back to Anzalian Bui O'Kean. Who doesn't love a name like that? Like, let me have, let, let me just go change my name. Anzalian came to Scotland from Ireland in 950 AD to help the Dane or to help fight against the Danes, or at least like that's the story that is, te is told. Um, and if you're a fan, <laughs> let me just plug, uh, if you're a fan of The Last Kingdom on Netflix, that this is kind of the timeline, like this is the same time period that this would be happening. Um, really good show. But for assisting in the fight against the Danes, he was given the Buchanan clan lands close to, the what the, the area of Scotland that's called Lo, Loch Lomond, and I get that wrong every single time because it's not how it looks when you try to read it. Um, and then another cool fun fact is there is a Buchanan Castle in Scotland, so I'm that's gonna have to be on my bucket list now. So needless to say, this was all super cool stuff, or at least to me it was. Um, and it makes you realize that you don't really know what you're gonna find. Like there's so much out there. But while I'm researching, like, you know, I think that's probably why people are drawn to this kind of research, because you get to find out cool things that you don't know. Um, and so in that air, like, you know, we're going to keep going because like cool things. Um, my so my paternal great grandfather's family settled in Tennessee very early on, hence the first family of Tennessee. <laughs> Um, this great grandfather's family traces back to Nicholas Gibbs. Yeah, so like if you've heard the Gibbs area here in town, it's that Gibbs apparently. Um, and prior to his family immigrating to the United States, the Gibbs they lived uh, for about a hundred years net along the Rhine River in Germany. So I thought that was really cool. Um, but Nicholas Gibbs, he was a Revolutionary War hero. Um, he was one of the first justices of the, justices of the peace in Knoxville and appointed by Governor William Blunt. Um, and he also served with James White, who is the founder of Knoxville. Um, so all of these things, you know, I didn't know until recently helped me build connections to my outside world. You know, it connected me to, you know, where I've grown up my whole life. Um, and it tells me, you know, where I'm from the experiences my family went through, the strengths that lie, you know, inside myself and like in all of us. And it can give us a sense of self-worth and, you know, be proud of like who you are and your heritage. Um, but I think that can also come with, you know, learning, like learning to forgive and move forward sometimes, because sometimes our history isn't this cool shiny fun fact that we want to share with the world but we, you know we take those pieces and we learn from them and we translate that to our own world and how we can make better versions of ourselves um 
And so that was just a little snippet into my own history. <laughs> and I hope that this kind of inspires, you know, you all to go research your own families because it's super cool. <laughs> um, but I'm thankful for like all the people who have dedicated their time to do this research um, because it, you know, it adds value to people's lives like my own and it can, you know, connect family pieces back together. So thanks for being here for Stories from the Stacks. I hope y'all liked it. Maybe you'll keep me, maybe? Mm. I don't know, what do you think, Paris? I wish I had like a little scorecard that was like 10. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting a thumbs up from me. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> so uh, mark your calendars, everyone, particularly you, Sarah and Paris, uh, for the next episode of For Your Reference on Thursday, October 21st at 7 Eastern. Mm -hmm. Can't get enough of UT Libraries. We have our first in conversation event of the fall uh, next Tuesday at 6 p.m. right here on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, we'll be welcoming the three authors of Family Hiking in the Smokies Hal Hubbs, Charles Maynard, and uh, do, oh, I forgot the other. Get, don't have the other guy's name here. Sorry about that. Um, Mod moderator Katie Kate, author of Have You Seen a Black Bear, will be uh, moderating. <laughs> so <laughs> check out lib.utk.edu for more information. And thank you all for being here. Have a Bye. good night, everybody. <laughs>